We feel our emotions. It's a signal for us to pay attention to do something, but we ignore them, right? I don't like them. I don't like that feeling, so I ignore it. And what happens over time is it builds. And then oftentimes people go to a therapist, and then a therapist, right, they have to reset it, whether it's a trauma or other things, and then a lot of emotions come up. And that's just, this is where a lot of people, they describe having anger outbursts, or they have crying spells, with, especially with grief, is because they try to stuff down their emotions, they ignore these signals, and then the pressure builds. So emotions are good because they're chemicals, signals, and that they specifically have two main functions. They communicate to us and they motivate us. So I'm, we're going to go through some examples here. Anxiety. What does anxiety communicate to us? Something's wrong, specifically danger, right? Anxiety communicates danger. Now, what does it motivate us to do? Escape from the danger, right? So here we see anxiety communicates danger and then motivates to escape that danger, right? Fight or flight, right? So when we're starting to feel anxious, let's say I see a snake. We'll use this example later. That says, hello, danger, and then some people might fight it. <laughs> some people might flee from it, right? So it communicates to us and then motivates us. Now, what I found very interesting is when I was reading in the spirit of prophecy, um, patriarchs and prophets, um, Satan had some fear. It's a good signal that was to alert him to the danger of the path that he was going. So here it says, for a time, Satan had feared to express the workings and imaginings of his mind, yet he did not dismiss them. And then he continued to cultivate them. And then at the bottom says, Lucifer was convinced that he was in the wrong. So feelings can help kind of be a, a signal, right? Hey, danger, you're going in the wrong path. And Satan ignored those feelings. We also see this with Eve. Eve was in the garden, right? And she started walking away from her husband. And what we see here in the middle says, on perceiving that she was alone, she felt an apprehension of danger. And this is fascinating because this is before the fall. Sometimes we think of anxiety, fear, you know, an apprehension of danger is because of the fall. No, this was before the fall. But what did she do? Did she pay attention to that signal? It says she dismissed her fears. And because she dismissed it, she was then tempted and she fell into temptation. Emotions can communicate us, to us and then motivate us to take action. Now, what about anger, Katie? Right? Anger is a bad emotion. Now, if you read the Bible, there's a key verse that says, be angry and, and sin not. Anger is not a sin. It's what we do with that anger. Anger can communicate to us and motivate us. So anger communicates that there's some sort of injustice, right? And then it motivates us to correct the injustice. Now you say, well, Katie, but I, I can think of times where I was angry, <laughs> angry at my spouse, angry at my boss, and it was not a good anger. Well, the reason is it's not the emotions that are bad. The main culprit is our thoughts. What are the thoughts behind the emotions? So if my emotions are just chemicals, well, what starts the chemical reaction? It's our thoughts. So when this verse is used to talk about emotions, it's actually, right, the heart is what? The mind. It's talking about the thoughts are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, not our emotions. Here we see in Spirit of Prophecy, she says, if the thoughts are wrong, the feelings will be wrong, right? There's a progression. Our feelings are fed by our thoughts. A way to think about this would be like a fire. I love analogies. It kind of helps us to better understand some of these, um, these principles. If you think about a campfire, right, the flames are like our emotions. Now, if you don't feed or fuel a fire, 
what happens to the fire eventually? It dies out. If we express our emotions, if we deal with them, they die out. But if we fuel the fire with logs, what happens? It either stays, maintains, or it grows. So if I think, oh, yeah, I just hate my boss. My boss is so unfair. They, he did this. She did that. Those thoughts is what's fueling the anger. The thoughts are the culprit, not the emotions. If you can also think about this for using this analogy, if you don't have logs in the first place, it's really difficult to start a fire. Right? We don't just have emotions spontaneously. They come from our thoughts. And if we think the emotions are the problem, we just want to push them down. And we never address the thoughts. So we're, we're blaming the emotions when it's actually our thoughts. That's why you see a lot of Bible verses talking about changing your thoughts, changing your thoughts. But what we do instead, typically, we don't like the emotions, so we push them away, and we never actually resolve those thoughts or those feelings. So here we see an example of how the thoughts are the culprit. Here's an example A. Emotion, you have anxiety, thought, ooh, a snake, right? And an action, run away. So that is good emotion, accurate thought. But let's say you have anxiety, maybe social anxiety, and you think, oh, I can't go to camp meeting, right? Or I can't go to that place. Everyone is criticizing me. Is that a true thought? No. Now, some people may be criticizing you, but not everyone. So is the anxiety bad or is the thought bad? The thought. The thought is inaccurate. So if I don't say, oh, I don't like to deal with social anxiety, I just don't want to go. That's how we deal with anxiety. We avoid. Do we ever correct the thought? No. And if we don't correct the thought, then we continue to have that anxiety over and over and over again. And then it results in actions like isolation, which then further complicates the situation. Here's another example with anger. Anger, you have the thought that child is being abused, right? Is that a good thought of if it's accurate, you see that something's happening and you say, yeah, because it's going to motivate me to fight off the abuser. That anger is good. It's accurate. Anger here is a chemical, but look at the thought. If you say everyone is against me, right, you feel attacked. The thought is the culprit, not the emotion. And you notice the action will follow. You might fight with or be cold with others. So here to summarize emotions, emotions are good. They're natural. They're God-given. They help us communicate to us and to others, and it helps motivate us to take a correct action. But emotions can seem bad dependent on how we manage them and specifically dependent on our thoughts, right? Our thoughts fuel our emotions. Now, what is Satan's agenda when it comes to emotions? Why do we often have a very negative view of emotions? Satan knows that on an individual level, if they are chemicals, if they communicate to us, then we're not listening to the signs, signs that can actually help us navigate through life, right? If I never have anxiety, I might approach a snake that's actually venomous, right? Or if I have, you know, anxiety about something that, is not valid, then I might be avoiding things in life. So on an individual level, it can lead to what I'll describe later on, ICE and ACE. I stands for ignore, conceal, and explode. What happens on an individual level is we ignore our emotions, we conceal them, and eventually we explode. The way that I like to think about that is Um, If you shake a soda bottle without opening it quite yet, what happens if you try to open it? Right. That's what happens with emotions. If you allow that pressure to build up inside you, when you try to open up, you might explode. And so you say, I don't want to open up the bottle then. I don't want to explode. But instead, how do you accurately open up that bottle? Has anyone tried it before? Slowly, right? You go, You close it real quick. Until finally, you go, and that's how emotions work. If you express them as they come, slowly, you can manage the intensity of those emotions. Now, Satan also knows that if we 
ignore our emotions, we often bleed on other people. There's a quote that says, if you don't heal, you'll bleed on people who didn't cut you. This happens a lot in the church. When we don't deal with our emotions, we take it out on people within the church. This happens with spouses. You had a hard day at work, and you didn't deal with those emotions. You come home, and who do you explode on? Who do you dump on? The person that didn't hurt you. So a lot of times, when we don't deal with our emotions, we actually end up hurting people close to us. So it's important to manage those emotions. And then God, we end up hating the body and the brain that God has given us. So Satan knows that if we have a negative view of emotions, then we will individually suffer, collectively suffer, and even um, address, uh, project this onto God. And ultimately what happens, it becomes fuel to the fire. The more we try to suppress our emotions, the bigger they become and they become more and more unmanageable. So what is God's solution? We don't have time to go through all the details of how to regulate our emotions, because we're gonna focus most of our time on how to change our thoughts, but I wanna encourage you all to start listening and befriending your body. Start, start, whenever you have an emotion, start asking yourself, what is this communicating to me? What is this motivating me to do? Befriend your body. Learn to manage your emotions, and then we'll talk about ace as well. Here's a good quote from a book called The Body Keeps the Score. Um, It's a book on trauma, and it specifically talks about when we don't deal with our emotions, when we don't deal with trauma, the body keeps the score, meaning the body often has physical ailments that are a result of those emotions and trauma. And he says here, Dr. Uh, Bezel says, neuroscience research shows that the only way we can change the way we feel is by becoming aware of our inner experience, of our emotions, and learning to befriend what is going on inside ourselves. So learning to be attuned to our bodies, learning to befriend our bodies. Now, this is gonna be the simplified version of things that we can do with our emotions, is does everyone remember ice, ignore, conceal, explode? The opposite of that would be ace. We want to ace our emotions. We want to accept, okay, emotions are good. I'm feeling this way. Clarify, why am I feeling this way? This will help you identify your thoughts that need to be changed. And then express. Emotions are like energy that need to be released. Now, remember, you need to check the thoughts because if you're like, okay, I need to release my anger. Well, if the thoughts are incorrect, then you need to change the thoughts first. And then often the anger can dissipate. But we need to accept, clarify, and then express our emotions. Okay. But for the remainder of our time together, I want to focus a lot on the main culprit, which are our thoughts. Now, how many thoughts do you think that we have a day? Any idea? I heard millions. Wow. (laughs) You must really think a lot. Not quite millions, but a lot. Yes. Any other guesses? Okay, hundreds. Um, We'll come back to that. What percentage of your thoughts, or our thoughts in general, do you think are negative? Too many. (laughs) Correct answer, yes. So research is a little bit inconclusive as to how many exactly, but generally they say more than 6,000, some average 12 to 50,000 thoughts a day. 80% are negative. That's a large percentage, right? And then 95% are actually repeated. So same, basically, same thought, different versions of our thoughts. And if you start realizing this, you're like, oh, yeah, I have similar thought patterns over and over again, which is actually encouraging because when you start working on your thoughts, you say, do I have to change 50,000 thoughts? That's a lot of thoughts. Keep every thought captive. (laughs) But no, we can find the main thoughts and the patterns and change those. Now, what is Satan's agenda with our thoughts? There's multiple layers to this, but I want you to consider, one, that he tries to have us to have distorted thinking, not complete lies. It's easy if someone comes up to you and say, hey, drink this black cup of poison, You'd be like, no, I'm not going to believe 100% of a lie for a thought. 
But if it's a clear glass of water with just a drop of poison, distorted thoughts means things that are tweaked. He also wants us to have ruminative thinking. So rumination, to go over and over and over again. I have many clients who say, oh, yeah, this one thing that happened 15 years ago. I'm like, wow, they're holding on to something that happened 15 years ago. Or even somebody says, oh, you know, how was your day? Oh, it was terrible. When something minor happened in the morning and they're ruminating on it all day long. So he wants us to have distorted thinking. He wants us to ruminate on that thinking. And then he also wants us to have avoidance of thinking. Just don't think about it. Why? Because if you don't think about it, you never address it. And then also, there's a form of positive thinking that can actually be unhealthy, which we'll talk about. But we're going to first focus on distorted thinking. Um, some of you, if you're familiar with uh, CBT specifically, you'll know this as cognitive distortions. There are 10 patterns of cognitive distortions. Some people like to think about it or call it stinking thinking. When I work with kids, this is what I talk about. You have stinking thinking. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through 10 different patterns. And as I do this, I want to encourage you all to try to be open to say, which are the patterns that I engage in the most? There's going to be a temptation to be like, oh, my spouse does that one, <laughs> or so-and-so does that one. But reflect on and ask the Spirit to say, hey, wh which ones do I engage in the most? We all engage in all of these. So if at the end of this you say, oh, I, I don't do any of those, then you're self-deceived because we all do these at different points, but there are some that we do more than others. We have kind of profiles of the ones that we do. So let's start with the first one, overgeneralization. This is when you conclude that what happened to you once will occur over and over again. So for example, if I ask you, how was your week? And you say, oh, it was, it was a horrible week. You took maybe one or two things that happened in your week and you overgeneralized to the entire week. Now, why would Satan want you to do this? Because your problem, which is actually this big, just became this big. If you, another example of overgeneralization might be, you know, oh, all pastors are this way. Are all pastors that way? Well, maybe you know two or three pastors that are a certain way, but you then just overgeneralize to a whole group. Now, we often do this because we want to protect ourselves, right? If, you know, after 9-11, there was an overgeneralization, all Muslims are terrorists, because we wanted to protect ourselves. We didn't know which ones could be terrorists. But the thing about this one is it actually doesn't protect us. Because what if somebody of another nationality comes and they're a terrorist? Did that protect you? So we're trying to some degree to have good thinking that protects us, but it actually harms us and creates a bigger problem than what's actual. Here are some other examples. If something happened in your past and you overgeneralize to your future, it'll happen again, right? Some people who struggle with mental illness, I'll always have depression, I'll always have anxiety. It's because they've had occurrences of these and then they overgeneralize to their life. So that's the first one, overgeneralization. The second one is mental filter. So this is when you see the negative in any situation and you dwell on it. And as it says, a filter, you filter out the positive. So there's both positive and negative in a situation, but you filter out the positive. Here's an example that we find in the spirit of prophecy, and it's a longer quote, so bear with me. Uh, while I was in Europe, a sister, this is Ellen White speaking, who had been doing this and who was in deep distress, wrote to me asking for some word of encouragement. The night after I had read her letter, I dreamed that I was in a garden, and one who seemed to be the owner of the garden was conducting me through its paths. I was gathering the flowers, enjoying their fragrance. When the sister who had been walking by my side called my attention to some unslightly briars that were impeding her way. There she was mourning and grieving. She was not walking in the pathway following the guide, but was walking among the briars and thorns. Oh, she mourned. Is it not a pity that this beautiful garden is spoiled with thorns? Then the guide said, let the thorns alone, for they will only wound you. Gather the roses, 
The lilies and the pinks, have there not been some bright spots in your experience? So here she had both the good and the bad, but she was filtering out all the beauty and focusing on the thorns. It continues, when you look back into the chapters of your life experience, do you not find some pleasant pages? It's encouraging you to focus on the positive. Are not God's promises like the fragrant flowers growing beside your path on every hand? Will you not let their beauty and sweetness fill your heart with joy? The briars and thorns will only wound and grieve you. And if you gather only these things, this is mental filtering, and present them to others, are you not, besides sliding the goodness of God yourself, preventing those around you from walking in the path of life? It is not wise to gather together all the unpleasant recollections of a past life its iniquities and disappointments, to talk over them and mourn over them until we are overwhelmed with discouragement. A discouraged soul is filled with darkness, shutting out the light of God from his own soul and casting a shadow upon the pathway of others. Isn't that powerful? A practical example of someone engaging in mental filter. And it's easy to be like, oh no, I wouldn't do that. But look at your thoughts. When something good happens, do you find that negative? Do you dwell on that negative? And it's easy to fall into discouragement because you'll find the thorns. The thorns are there. We live in a broken world. There are negative things all around us. But what do you draw your attention to? The third one is disqualifying the positive. Now, this one might seem a little similar to mental filter. The difference here is mental filter has both negative and positive, and you disqualify the positive in the sense of only focus on the negative. This one only has positive, but you see the positive and you disqualify it. This is a good example of how do you respond when you receive a compliment, right? It's a positive if you're like, nope, right? Or, oh, that was a fluke, right? Or that was just, you know, sometimes we do this of like, praise the Lord, right? As in like, I don't feel comfortable with it. Do we disqualify the positive? And they say this one is particularly dangerous because this creates a mindset of never seeing the positive. The positive is there, but you dismiss it. Sometimes with my clients, I say, oh, you said that you had a really good week, right? And they're like, oh, well, to, you know, next week, my depression's gonna come back again. They disqualify the positive. If someone says, you did a really good job, oh, well, it was just this one time is we're disqualifying the good and we're robbing God of his glory by disqualifying those positives. The next one is a very common one. Um, so it's often referred to as magnification or catastrophizing. This is when we blow up something out of proportion. So I have a classic example of this. This, this was from a 15 year old and it might sound a little ridiculous, but this is truthful as it happens. Um, so this 15 year old was talking about exam. She's like, oh, I'm so stressed about an exam. She's like, if I don't pass this exam, I'm going to fail the class. And if I don't fail, if I fail the class, then I'm going to fail out of high school. If I fail out of high school, I'm going to, you know, be, you know, without a job. And if I don't have a job, I'm going to be homeless. I'm going to be living in a car and then I'm going to be living in a car and I can't keep the car. So I'm going to be living in a box and then I'm going to be living in a box and then someone's going to come and steal my box. And I was like, Oh my, <laughs> she just magnified that from taking a test and possibly failing, it's possible, to all of a sudden being homeless without a box. Now we laugh, but we do this. A problem is this big and we magnify it, right? When you ask, oh, how was that? Oh, it was terrible, horrible. These words that magnify a problem, right? Now the opposite of that is minimization. So some people tend to have a tendency of magnification. Other people have the tendency of minimization. How was it? Oh, it was fine. It's not that big of a deal. Minimizing the problem more than what actually it is. I have a lot of um, clients who suffer from trauma, and they do this a lot. Now, you might say, oh, isn't that good? You're trying to cope well with it. No, because you need to have the truth of what you're dealing with. If it really is hard, it's hard. And how do I deal with it? But if I say, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, I'm okay. Are you ever really dealing with it? No. 
So you don't want to magnify a problem, but you also don't want to minimize it either. This is often how we um, deal with our problems. We are actually bigger, and I would say God is bigger than our problems. But oftentimes, we view the opposite way. We see ourselves as a tiny little mouse and the elephant as our problem, right? Are we seeing our difficulties and problems accurately? This next one comes in two parts, um, personalization and blame. So personalization is when we have the tendency to conclude that every negative event is your fault. So your child comes home and, you know, brings your report card and they have, you know, not so good grades. Oh, I'm such a terrible mother, right? You personalize it to you. Is it your fault? Maybe to some degree it can be, but is it entirely your fault? No. There are other factors your child has a choice, right? Your, their teachers or other factors, but this tendency is, it's all my fault. If you have a tendency to over-apologize, you most likely suffer from personalization. I'm sorry. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I once had a person, they're like, oh, you know, I said, you know, you say sorry a lot. You, you don't have to be sorry for that. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, I said, I'm sorry. <laughs> right? It's this idea that there's something wrong with me that it's always my fault, now, the other extreme to that is blaming. It's always other people's faults. So in the case of a parent might say, oh, it's my fault for a child, the child might say, oh, it's my parent's fault. Now, there may be truth to that. Some people are to blame, but are they entirely to blame? So what you start seeing in these different patterns is what we're looking for is the truth. If you are responsible, you are responsible. Do not blame others. If you're not responsible, do not blame yourself, right? If others are to blame, it is important for them to accept that responsibility. So attributing blame where blame actually lies, or I should say fault lies. This one is another one of the top three um, cognitive distortions. It's entitled all or nothing thinking, or sometimes people refer to it as black and white thinking. We, as human beings in general, love this type of thinking. It provides a lot of safety and comfort. If things are either black or they're white. Ooh, gray makes me feel uncomfortable. So for example, if I mess up, I say, oh, that was, that was a complete failure, right? Neither a success or a failure, black or white, nothing in between. You interpret events as either extremely good or bad. We label people good or bad. Right? Things as perfect or failure, extremes. We can also use a lot of absolutes. If you notice yourself using a lot of absolutes of, oh, he never washes the dishes. Very all or nothing. Most likely they have, maybe rarely, but not to the extreme of all or nothing. Okay. The next one is very common, I think, within Christianity. And there's a little bit, you might have a little pushback for me, and I had initially when I first learned this, and so I'll explain, I'll kind of walk us through it. Should statements um, are problematic because they create pressure, pressure to yourself by saying, I should do this, I must do that, I have to, okay? And what happens with that pressure, if we don't do it, we feel a lot of guilt. Now, you might say, this is the pushback here, Katie, aren't there things that we should do? Right? I should go to church, I should read my Bible, I should exercise. So what's so problematic about that? Remember, a lot of pressure, external pressure, and then a lot of guilt if I don't. Now, to give you uh, an opposite of how to counter this is to change your external pressure to an internal choice. They do this a lot in weight loss programs or other programs to say, instead of saying, I should exercise, you say, I can, it's an option, or I want to. Now think about that in application to devotionals. How do you think your devotional experience might change if you change it from, I should read the Bible, to I want to? In you know, January 1, people start saying, oh, I should exercise, I should exercise. A lot of pressure externally, then a lot of guilt after several weeks of them not accomplishing their goals. 
So instead, it's an internal choice. I want to, I can. And if you think about when we talked about choice and God, what this is referring to is a lot of times we have external pressures of I should do these things from other people, from God, from, but we never choose it for ourselves. If you wanna be successful in life, you need to start realizing that you have a lot more choice than you recognize. Every single day you have choices. Instead of saying, I should do this, I should, even if spouses, oh, I should do this for my spouse, change that to, I want to, I can. And if you really don't want to, you don't have to do it. Nobody is forcing you, even God. I was working with a pastor um, through CBT, and he's like, oh, this is great, because even the original, when you look at the Ten Commandments, where we read it as you shall, it's actually you will. Right? When we love God, we will naturally, is it hard? Do you go around saying, oh, I shouldn't kill someone today? <laughs> no, because naturally, if you love people, you're not going to do that. So we want to change our shoulds to I can's. I cannot, I can, I want to. Make it an internal choice instead of an external pressure. Now, I wanted to briefly just touch on this. We don't have time to go into it. But though, for those of you who struggle with perfectionism, it's very, very common. It's a combination of all or nothing thinking and should statements. I should be perfect, all or nothing, nothing in between. This is extremely problematic because you have a lot of pressure with unrealistic expectations. And instead, I like Brene Brown. She talks about how perfectionism is like the front seat Shame is in the passenger seat, and then you have fear in the back. What's driving perfectionism is fear. And then when you don't um, act perfectly, you're going to have a lot of shame. And Satan wants us to feel that way because if I'm not perfect, then I'm a failure. And then I'm so discouraged that I don't want to get back up. But the Bible talks about falling, right? Proverbs 24, 16 says, a righteous man falls seven times. Right? It's the number of perfection. Why? Because he's falling and getting back up. That's the idea of perfection is getting back up. Psalm 37 says, you know, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And then it goes on to say, though he fall, not if he may fall, though he fall, we will fall. So we, it's not that we expect perfection. What I have my clients change that expectation from perfection to striving for excellence. I want to do my best. Not what's perfect, my best. And sometimes my best is up here. Sometimes my best is here. And you say, God, I'm going to do my best and supply for all my deficiencies. Um, number eight, we have just a couple more to go through. Labeling and mislabeling. This is where we attribute someone's mistakes or shortcomings to their identity. Now, sometimes we do this with others, but also we do it with ourselves. I make a mistake and I say, oh, you're such a failure, right? Or you make a mistake, you're such a loser. If you struggle with road rage, you probably label people. They're a jerk. They do this. They do that, right? When we label people, we, do, we attribute that one thing to who they are. And is that accurate? No. We're not our mistakes. I made a mistake, but I'm not a mistake. I may have made a poor decision, but it doesn't make me bad. We do this with parenting. Oh, you're such a good girl when they do something well. Have you done that before? We're attributing what they do to their identity. That's very problematic. And then when they don't do something well, you're such a bad boy. You're such a bad girl. You're making someone believe that they are their mistakes. Emotional reasoning is one of the most problematic ones. Now, we talked about how emotions can be good, but if you have thoughts behind it that you say, my emotions are truth without looking at your thoughts, you're going to have a lot of problems. This is where you accept your emotions as truth and you let them reason for you. I feel like I don't want to do anything today, therefore, I don't do anything today. Now, sometimes you look at your thoughts and say, no, 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 I need to get up today. I got to go to work. I tell my clients, if I had emotional reasoning, there are many times I wouldn't have come to work <laughs> because sometimes I don't feel like it. But there are individuals, some in this room, that will struggle with reasoning based off of how they feel. I feel it, therefore it's true. There, you always need to analyze and check your feelings. 
Here are some examples. I feel bad, therefore it is bad. Um, I feel scared, therefore this is a bad situation. That's extremely common with anxiety. I'm anxious at a grocery store. Oh, some, there must be danger. Well, you analyze. Is this because I had a past trauma in a grocery store? Just because I had a past trauma, this trigger doesn't mean that I'm in danger again. That happened before, right? If I get anxious around people because once upon a time somebody was really hurtful to me, well, is this person also problematic? I need to check my feelings. I feel jealous, therefore you're up to something, right? We use our emotions as a guide. And then the last one um, is in two, they're under the umbrella of jumping to conclusions. I was laughing with my husband last night as I remembered a joke um, of, and don't take this in a wrong way, but they say some people, the most exercise they do is jumping to conclusions. Um, is this idea that we jump to a conclusion, either mind reading or fortune telling. So first we'll focus on mind reading. This is when you assume that you know what the other person is thinking. Okay, so an example of this is if you see me maybe at lunch and you say, hi, Katie, and I walk right past you. I don't say hi, I don't even look at you. What's your first thought? Oftentimes I, oftentimes I can use this as a test with my clients. If their immediate first thought is she's mad at me, you have mind reading distortions. If you're like, oh, I don't know, maybe she didn't see me, maybe she you know, um, is mad at me, maybe you know, she has something on her mind. So mind reading is jumping to a conclusion, I know what they're thinking. Oh, I know that person is mad at me. Oh, what evidence do you have? Well, I mean, they looked at me a little funny. I had a person who actually told me, I said hi to you, and I said, I, were you even there? <laughs> I was so much in my head, or sometimes people are wearing AirPods or doing other things. So we can't jump to a conclusion. So you have two options with mind reading. Either you actually go ask that person or you let it go. Mind reading happens a lot in church. Oh, I know so-and-so is blah, 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 right? And we never are honest and truthful. And as Matthew talks about, and the Gospels talk about going to your brother and talking to them, a lot of conflict would be resolved these days if we talk to one another. But sometimes it's a little awkward. You're not going to go up to someone and say, are you mad at me? <laughs> so if you cannot talk to the person, you have to let it go. It's not fair to them for you to conclude something without their input. You wouldn't want it to be done to you either. The second part to that is fortune telling. This is when you predict that something bad will happen in the future. This was also an example of my teenager who said, oh, I know that I'm going to fail tomorrow, right? Do you know the future? No. So can you predict it? Oh, I know I'm going to fail. Or, oh, I have a doctor's appointment tomorrow. Oh, I just, oh, it's going to be bad news. I know it's going to be bad news. You don't know, right? The Bible says, do not worry about tomorrow. And I love how it adds, you know, each day has enough trouble of its own. Like, just focus on today. It's a lot already. But fortune telling, what it does is it takes the worries of tomorrow and puts it on today. And when you get to tomorrow, some of those are not even there. You know that they say 85% of things we worry about never actually happen? 85%. And the 15% that you may be, well, there's still 15%, we're actually better able to handle it than what we expect. So... It's important to not fortune tell. You're adding more stress to your life than what's necessary. So now we're going to do a little kind of quiz thing to sort of get you familiar with trying to label the distortions. Because what you all need to do is when you leave here, when you're having certain negative thoughts, you want to catch them and start saying, oh, that was mind reading, right? And change them. So here are some biblical examples. Okay, this is Abraham and Sarah in Genesis chapter 12 and 20. And it talks about the Egypt experience, right? And he said to his wife, Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but will let you live. Say, you are my sister then. Right? He's like, say, you know, do this so that I will be treated well for your sake and my life will be spared because of you. And then later on, Pharaoh says, you know, what have you done to me? Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? 
Why did you say she's my sister so that I took her to be my wife? Now then, here's your wife, take her and go. Which cognitive distortion is this? Fortune telling. He's like, I know that this is what they're going to do. A little bit of mind reading too. I know this is the way they're going to think. And I know that this is going to be the way that it's going to happen. And you notice the effects of this distortion. It led him to lie, right? And not just lie, but if you think about the spiritual ramifications of this, he showed a lack of faith in God. When we fortune tell, when we mind read, it's we're putting ourselves in the place of God. And so we need to be careful, and we know that our thoughts then lead to poor actions. Okay, let's look at another one, Genesis chapter 25. This is Jacob and Esau, another well-known story. And Jacob comes to Esau, who's cooking a stew, and he says, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. Jacob replied, first sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is, it, is this birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath and they had that exchange. Which distortion is this? Magnification, right? I'm going to die. Is he going to die? No, I used to say when we were little, I'd be like, oh, I'm starving. And my dad would say, you're not starving, you're hungry. <laughs> Right? And I was like, yeah, that's true. We're blowing it up out of proportion. And you notice, again, ramifications of our distortions. Because he's like, I'm going to die, he magnified his, his problem in a way that made him desperate to engage in an action that was not the right decision for him. Okay, let's look at the, no the next one, Numbers 13. But the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people. For they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There, there we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. Which one is this? Exaggeration, yes, catastrophizing magnification. There's another one in here that's similar. And minimization. So what they did is they magnified their enemies and they minimized themselves, li literally with the sight of their giants. And we are grasshoppers. Remember that elephant and that mouse? And also what's not said here, but implied, they minimized God and they magnified their problem. This is something that we do way too often as Christians. We magnify our problems and we minimize God. And we see the implications for them as well. So here's kind of a list of the 10 distortions. As a reminder, if you want my slides or if you want any specific handouts, you can email me and I can send you digital versions. But it's important to start checking which of these distortions do I engage in the most. Now, why? Why do we struggle with this? Why does Satan tempt us with these distortions? Romans 12, 2 is one of those verses that really highlights the importance of our thoughts. It says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. And you notice, it's a continual process. Oftentimes, people start working on their thoughts, and it's a lot of work, and then they just want to give up because they just want to have a fix. It's a constant effort to keep our thoughts captive. Renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Here's another um, version. It says, by changing the way you think, then you will learn to know God's will for you. So why does Satan tempt us with distorted thinking? He knows that if you think negatively, you won't be transformed. You won't be a new person. And he also knows that you won't know and do God's will, right? It says, be renewed, and then you can do his will. We can't do his will if we have distorted thinking. There's another verse, Proverbs 4, watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flows the springs of life. Here's another version, carefully guard your thoughts. Does it say, check your thoughts once in a while? carefully guard your thoughts. We do not do this enough. We allow our thoughts to just be thoughts. 
be careful how you think. And then it says, for it determines the course of your life. Another version says, your life is shaped by your thoughts. Because we read it oftentimes, oh, it springs, you know, from the, you know, from life. It says, your life is shaped by your thoughts. An another philosopher, you know, mentioned this. We see it from the Bible, but then they put in their own words. Watch your thoughts, they become words. Watch your words, they become actions. Watch your actions, they become habits. Watch your habits, they become character. Watch your character, it becomes your destiny. This is why Satan tempts us with these thoughts. They're not just thoughts. They're thoughts because he knows that everything in your life is determined by your thoughts, including your character and your salvation. This is why mental health is so important. This is why we're talking about surrendering your thoughts and your emotions. These are the things that get in the way of following Jesus. So here's the three reasons why we see in Scripture Satan's tempting us because he doesn't want us to be transformed. He doesn't want us to know and do God's will. And then he knows that our life, including our salvation, is determined by our thoughts. So the question then becomes, what types of thoughts should I be thinking, right? And a lot of times we respond to, think positive. I just need to be positive. But what is God's solution? Is it really just to think positively? John 8, 32 says, you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And more specifically, we see in Philippians 4, 8, we jump down to, oh, whatever is pure and lovely. But what's the first one there? True. What our goal is with our thinking is not positive thinking. It's truthful thinking. Let me give you an example of this. If you make a mistake and, and you hurt a friend and you have this negative thought, I'm a horrible friend, I'm a horrible person, that's negative not, and not true, right? But then if you go to the opposite, I need to think positively. Oh, it's fine, don't worry about it. Is that helpful? Is that true? No, because it doesn't lead you to make amends with your friend. So what would be the truth? I made a mistake. I hurt my friend. And sometimes the truth is not pleasant. But it says the truth will set you free. So what we want is truthful thinking, not positive. And a lot of people will say like, oh, you know, I, I'm really struggling with my thoughts. I'm really trying to be positive. And a lot of times it's because your brain won't believe it because it's not true. Right? It's kind of like we put a Band-Aid on a deeper wound. Positivity can be helpful if it's true. But it's, if it's not true, we need to hold on to whatever is true as well as things that are lovely and pure and pleasurable and helpful for us. So I like to ask myself, is this thought true? Is this thought helpful? And is it in my control? Because then it motivates me to action. So think, and other versions say meditate, dwell on these things. And then one of the verses I love the most in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, which is talking about that spiritual warfare, that great controversy we talked about, it tells us the secret, one of the secrets that we can do to fight in that great controversy, to take every thought captive. You bring your thought to God and you say, God, oh, I'm really mad at so-and-so. Oh, that person really hurt me. Is this thought true? Is this thought helpful? You're surrendering your thoughts to him. Sometimes, you, and then you, let's say you have a negative thought about yourself. You're like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm a failure, God. I feel so terrible. You bring that to him. You say, God, because when it says take every thought captive to Christ, Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So we're taking it to the truth giver, to who is truth, and he can help correct our thoughts. Right? He can help us. When you go sometimes to friends or others, they might try to help you, you know, be positive. Now, pray if it is helpful to have others around you that are truth seekers too, because they can help you also in that journey to realize what is the truth. So I like to think about in a very simple way, these three C's, right? How do I deal with my thoughts? Catch, check, change. Catch your negative thought, check it. What's the evidence for? What's the evidence against? 
and then change it. Change it to a more truthful, balanced, helpful thought. Check, catch, check, change. Three C's. Catch, check, change. And I also like this. I found this, um, you know, it's in reference to 2 Corinthians 10.5. It's an acronym for thoughts. It says, is it true? Does this thought honor God? What's its origin? I like to often ask, is this from God or is this from Satan? Because Satan is, remember, the father of all lies. And then, is it uplifting? Does it involve guilt? Is it helpful? Is it a temptation? Does it strengthen you? These are questions that we can ask. Now, we don't have time to go into this, but for some of you who have maybe done CBT or will do CBT, um, there's what we call a thought record or a thought diary where you write down, okay, what's the situation? What are my thoughts? And then I start challenging and wrestling with them. And it's like a, you know, a diary that you may have done when you were young, but specifically guiding, guiding you through the steps of changing your thoughts. There's a lot of questions that we can ask ourselves. And so I include this for more so not to go through together, but for those of you who will have my slides, there are questions that you can ask. For example, you know, is there an alternative explanation to this? Um, if a friend was going through the situation, what would I tell him or her, right? Different questions that can help you have different perspectives to your thought. And then the same way that we talked about with behavior is that you have a choice, right? You can choose to follow Jesus, right, with our behaviors of following healthy behaviors, or we can choose a path that leads to destruction. We always have choices with our thoughts, do we choose to believe the truth about ourselves, about others, about God? Or do we choose to continue to have unhealthy, negative thoughts that are lies from the enemy? We have choices. Overall, I want you to think about this. It's putting each thought on trial. And you're giving it a fair trial by listening to both sides. If you have the thought, I'm stupid. Okay, why am I thinking this? What's the evidence against? Wrestling with it to have the truthful answer. With Christ as the judge, we can't judge because we're biased towards the negative, and Christ deciding whether or not these thoughts are true or false. And just know this, practice makes perfect, and that's so true for our thoughts. If you know the idea behind neuroplasticity, if you have a negative thought pattern that you've been feeding into for years, this is not going to be something that you're going to wake up tomorrow morning, unless it's a miracle, and all of a sudden you have a completely renewed mind. Remember, it said, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's a constant effort saying, God, I want to have the mind of Christ. I want to have truthful thoughts. And it's really important to start creating a new habit in the way that you think. So to close, I want you to reflect on these questions. What is your view on emotions? And depending on that view, how has it impacted your emotional and mental well-being? How has it impacted you in helping others manage their emotions? Remember, because if we have a negative view of emotions, we're going to suppress them. And then that can lead to further problems. What lies have you been believing about yourself or others? Have the, how has these impacted you, your family, the church, etc.? And then what is one thing you can do to begin to better manage your emotions and to better have truthful, balanced thoughts? And remember, we always want to emphasize information plus application equals transformation. So I want to encourage you all to leave here and start practicing, not by saying so-and-so is doing a cognitive distortion, but looking at self and saying, God, I want to surrender these thoughts to you. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father God, we thank you so much for all of your truths in your word. They're so beautiful, so practical, and so often, God, we just read really quickly through them, but you have given us a mental health manual that you have given us these principles to help us have renewed minds. And God, we have listened too far, too often to the enemy and his lies. So God, I pray that each one here may have the experience of having their, their mind renewed in you and that we may have each here the mind of Christ. 
Please help us in this, Lord. We cannot do it in our own strength. We ask for the spirit of truth. We ask for Jesus as our truth. And we ask that you may lead us into truth. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.